In this video I'm going to be talking about the binomial theorem and if you think this equation looks scary, don't worry because by the end of this video you're going to understand what this theorem is all about. Firstly, why is the binomial theorem useful? This is pretty easy to see with an example. So you know how to expand things like x plus y squared. This is a binomial in here because it has two terms. And to expand those brackets, you would write the two brackets and then you'd use FOIL, so multiply everything out and you'd get your expanded expression. So x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. But what about something like x plus y to the power of 10 or x plus y to the power of 15 or 20 or 100? How do we expand out an expression like this? Well, if we continue to solve this the way we would do brackets like x plus y squared, we would have to write out all of these brackets 10 times and then we'd have to multiply all of those brackets. Um, so do you really want to do that? I can't even think how long that would take, uh, but let's not. The binomial theorem can tell you the terms in this expansion straight away. So rather than having to worry about multiplying all of these brackets, you can straight away know that firstly there's 11 terms in this expansion and you can work out what each term in that expansion will be using the binomial theorem. So for example, the first four terms in that expansion of these brackets, x plus y to the power of 10 would be x to the power of 10 plus 10x to the power of 9y plus 45x to the power of 8y squared plus 120x to the 7y cubed. And there would be another seven terms there that I haven't shown. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear why the binomial theorem is useful to expand binomials with powers more than two or three. So to understand this theorem, we need to firstly talk about factorials and the combination formula. So firstly, factorials. What are factorials? Well, this is the strange phenomenon where if you shout a number, here we have three exclamation mark, that means you need to shout three, like three, it becomes six. So the value of the number increases. Oh, where's that laugh track? <laughs> of course I'm joking. Factorials are actually where you multiply that number by all of the whole numbers or natural numbers less than this number. So in this case, three. Three factorial will be three times two times one, which is six. So the factorial of any number is a product of multiplying that number by all of the natural numbers less than it. Some more examples, four factorial will be four times three times two times one. This is 24. Five factorial will be five times four times three times two times one. This is 120 and so on. Uh, in general, we can say n factorial will be n multiplied by n take one, the number one less than n, multiplied by n take two, all the way down to one. And we can write this expression in a slightly different way. We can say n factorial is n multiplied by n take one factorial. And I'm writing it in this way because we need to define zero factorial. What is zero factorial? Well, this is really a meaningless question. It's like asking what something to the power of zero is. And remember, we define that as one, but asking what something to the power of zero is, is meaningless. Like how can we multiply A by itself zero times? But we define it as one, otherwise everything else breaks. Let's look at one factorial. This must be one because there's no natural numbers less than one, so it's just one. We don't need to multiply it by anything. But using this expression here, n multiplied by n take one factorial, this would be one multiplied by one take one factorial, which is one multiplied by zero factorial. And in order for zero not to equal one, we know zero factorial must be one here. Okay, so in order for this to be consistent. So we say zero factorial equals one, otherwise one equals zero. And obviously we do not want one to equal zero. Okay, so that's factorials and we also define zero factorial and factorials are useful as a way to describe the ways of arranging a number of objects. So factorials represent the number of ways of arranging n objects. Let's look at an example. Uh, how many ways can you arrange three objects? Let's say I have a red, blue and green button. Uh, we can think about this uh, using spaces. So I have three spaces to place these buttons in. In the first space, I have three options to choose from. In the second space, I've already picked a button, so I only have two options to choose from. And in the last space, uh, let's say I picked a red button in the first space, then a blue, I only have the green button left. And we multiply these to figure out the number of possibilities. This is called the product rule, and you've probably seen this before. So we have three times two times one, 
ways of arranging three objects. And what do you notice here? We have three factorial, right? Three times two times one is three factorial, which is six. And if you're visually minded, these are the six ways to arrange those three colors. If you're wondering how this relates to binomials, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to look at another example first. So how many ways can you arrange four objects? Well, if three objects is three factorial, four objects is four factorial, which is 24. So we can arrange these four colors in 24 different ways. And here they all are. The reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to consider a slightly different question, which is how many ways can you choose two objects from a group of four? And here we're going to think of the first two colors as the ones you choose and the ones on the right as the ones left over. So if we look at these two arrangements here, I've picked a red, then a blue button, and then I have a green and a white button left over. Now, when you're thinking about these types of questions where they say how many ways to choose objects, we don't care about the order of the objects left over. So we don't care that it's a green or white or a white, then a green button. All we care about is that what we have in our hand is a red and a blue button. Similarly, these two arrangements would be considered the same if we're asking how many ways to choose two objects from a group of four, because I've also ended up with a blue and a red button. Even though I've picked them in a different order, I still have those same colors after I make my choices. So although these four options are considered different arrangements, when we're talking about choosing objects, we consider them the same, okay? So this block of arrangements is all one option when we say how many ways to choose two uh, objects. Okay, then we could look at another example. So here we have blue green. I've picked a blue and a green and I have a red and a white button left over. And these two options would be considered the same because I end up with a green and a blue button in my hand. It doesn't matter about the order. Okay, so this block of arrangements is considered the same as well. So to answer the question, how many ways can you choose two objects from a group of four? We can divide all of the arrangements up into blocks of four. So this would be another uh, possible way of choosing, you know, white and green or white and blue or red and green or red and white. So the answer to that question is six. And what do we call this when we divide things up into groups? We're dividing, right? So we've taken the four factorial ways of arranging those objects and we've divided by something. What are we dividing by? Well, we're dividing by the way of arranging the picks. So I could have red, blue or blue, red. And also we need to consider the way of arranging the objects left over. So green, white or white, green. And that gives us our groups of four. So we divide by four. How can we generalize this further? So if I want to answer more questions like this, I need a formula, right? This is the combination formula and it looks like this. So we start with the total number of arrangements of the number of objects and we divide by the number of ways of arranging the objects chosen. So the picks, the objects you choose, and also we divide by the number of ways of arranging the objects not chosen. So in our example, we had four factorial divided by two factorial, the way of arranging the two objects chosen and the ones left over. In this case, it's four take two factorial, which is the same, but that's just a coincidence, right? It might be different. You know, for example, if we had five objects and we picked two, that'd be five take two factorial left over, which would be three factorial. So anyways, we can calculate this. This is 24 divided by four, which is six. So there are six ways of choosing two objects from a group of four. And now we have a general formula, which we can apply to other examples. So the combination formula looks like this. This symbol means N choose R. So N is the number of objects you have and R is the number of objects you choose. So in our case, we had four objects and we we're choosing two. N factorial is the total number of arrangements. R factorial is the ways of arranging the objects chosen and uh, N take R factorial is the way of arranging the objects not chosen. And this formula gives us the number of ways of choosing R objects from a group of size N. So let's look at another example. How many ways are there of choosing three objects from a group of five? This is five choose three, which is five factorial over three factorial multiplied by five, take three factorial. If you work this out, you get an answer of 10. And just a note that we say five choose three. That's how we say that symbol there. And you can also write it like this. 
where you have big brackets. The number on top is the size of the group and the number on the bottom is how many objects you choose from that group. And you might be thinking, this looks like a column vector. Uh, this is not, this has nothing to do with vectors. It's just a coincidence that it looks the same. So that's another way of writing this symbol, five choose three. So we have our combination function or combination formula, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's look at some more examples. What if we have something like three choose three or four choose zero? Uh, what might these be? Well, three choose three is three factorial over three factorial three take three factorial, which is three factorial over three factorial zero factorial, which is just going to be six over six, which is one. What about four choose zero? So this is saying I have a group of four things and I want to choose zero of them. How many ways are there of doing that? Uh, well, four choose zero is four factorial over zero factorial, four factorial, which is 24 over 24, which is one. So that might sound a bit strange, you know, asking the question, how many ways to choose zero things? But it sort of makes sense as well. There's only one way to choose zero things. It's not to choose any. Um, and at least that's how we define it. So if it doesn't make sense to you, you're going to have to get used to that. So in general, n choose n is one and n choose zero is one. Okay, now we can get back to the binomial theorem. Let's look at a simpler example first. a plus b to the power of three. We could write out the brackets. And now I want you to notice something. Uh, when we multiply these, we're multiplying the terms in each bracket by everything in the other brackets. So for example, I could multiply this a by this a and this b, or this a by this b and this a. And you could think about it actually as choosing these terms. So I could choose this b and this a and this a, or I could choose this b and this b and this a, so we can think about it as choosing these terms. That's why we were just talking about, you know, how many ways of choosing different objects, because that gives us a much faster way to figure out what this will be. Um, well, multiplying these brackets is not too bad when there's three sets, but when we look at, you know, higher exponents, it's really useful to think about it as choosing the terms from each bracket. So the first one to consider is how many ways of choosing B zero times from each set of brackets. So I only want to choose the A terms. Well, I could pick this A and this A and this A, and there's only one way to do that, right? In other words, what I've just asked you is to work out three choose zero. So I have three options and I want to choose zero B terms. So three choose zero is one. And when we get our answer, we can see we only have one lot of A cubed. And the next term, A squared B, this is like asking how many ways of choosing B once from a group of three. So I could pick this B and this A and this A, or this B and this A and this A, or this B and these two A's. So we get three choose one lots of A squared B, and we get three choose two lots of A B squared, and three choose three lots of B cubed, and that's how we're working out the terms. So this is a much more useful way to think about expanding brackets. The number of ways of choosing B, the second term in the brackets zero times, once, twice, and three times from a group of three. In this case, because we're cubing these brackets, but if the exponent is four, then you have to go up to four and so on. So I'll just quickly show you how we write this out using the binomial theorem. Uh, when we get an expression like this, a binomial to the power of something, we write it like this. So three choose zero. This is saying I want to choose B zero times out of three options, as I was saying. Then three choose one A squared B, then three choose two A B squared, then three choose three b cubed. Now we know three choose zero is one, three choose three is one. We just need to work out these two, three choose one, three choose two. Well, we already know they're going to be three, but let's just look at the calculations as well. So three choose one is three factorial over one factorial, three take one factorial. This is six on two, which is three. And three choose two is the same deal, six on two, which is three. So we get the same expansion, of course. Okay, let's look at a more complicated example a plus b to the power six. Let's write out all the brackets just to get a visual of what's going on. So again, we're asking the question, how many ways of choosing b zero times? That's the first question. In other words, from this group of six, I'm choosing b zero times. So we have six choose zero, lots of a to the power six. Then how many ways of choosing b once out of a group of six? This is six choose one, a to the power five b. So because I picked b once, I have 
five lots of A and one lot of B, that's where these exponents are coming from, then how many ways of choosing B twice, six choose two, A to the power four B squared, and so on. So how many ways of choosing B three times, four times, five times, and six times, and this is how you get your terms in your binomial expansion. And we could calculate each of these coefficients by hand using our combination formula. So six choose two would be six factorial over two factorial, six take two factorial. Uh, but I want to show you how to do this on a calculator as well. So let's get our calculators out. So your calculator should have this uh, function built into it somewhere. And on my calculator, I need to go into math and the probability menu and I have this NCR, that's N choose R. Your calculator may have it on the face somewhere or in one of the menus. Just look for this notation NCR and that's the function you want to use. So to use this function, you enter the number of objects in the group, in this case six, then you go to NCR and then you put in the number of objects chosen. In this case, it's two. So this is going to be six choose two and it will do the calculation for me. So I get 15. So in this expansion, there'll be 15 lots of a to the power of 4 b squared. Then let's do 6 choose 3. 6 choose 3 is 20. 6 choose 4. 6 choose 4 is 15 again. 6 choose 5 will be 6. And we know 6 choose 6 and 6 choose 0 already. So now that we've calculated all of those coefficients, we know that a plus b to the power 6 is a to the power 6, 6 a to the power 5b plus 15 a to the power 4b squared plus 20 a cubed b cubed plus 15 a squared b to the power 4 plus 6ab to the power 5 plus b to the power 6. And we figured that out without having to multiply any brackets. Pretty cool, right? Uh, so in general, this is the binomial theorem. So a plus b to the power n is a to the power n plus n choose 1, lots of a to the power n take 1 b. So that exponent there is just saying, well, we're not picking n lots of a anymore. We've got one lot of b. We've got one lot of that second term in there. So now we have b and one less a, and then n choose 2 will be a to the power n take 2 b squared, and so on up to n choose r, a to the power n take r, b to the power r, all the way up to b to the power n. And that is the binomial theorem. So now that you understand each part of that, hopefully you'll never forget it and you don't have to memorize it because you understand what's going on. Rather than thinking about this as a multiplication, you're thinking about it as choosing the terms from each set of brackets. And that's all that this theorem is saying. In the next video, I will look at problems you can solve using the binomial theorem and how you can make your life a bit easier by creating an n choose r table. Uh, because when you're solving binomial expansion problems, you'll be calculating a lot of these uh, n choose r values. I would suggest making a bit of a cheat sheet for yourself. Uh, so all of that in the next video. I hope you found this useful. See you in the next one. Bye for now.